beginning a series this week on the parables of Jesus. Because as I said last week, if we are going to commit this year to walking closer to Jesus, to being more like Jesus, then who better to learn from than Jesus actually himself? Now, I want to tell you, I put a handout in your uh, bulletin today that lists out uh, 46 parables that are in the Bible, and it has the scriptural references. So if you ever want to say, like, gee, I'd like to know more about this parable, it has the Bible reference for you. Please feel free to look at it. Um, we are not, you know, just to put you guys at ease, we are not going to be going over at each and every parable. Um, it's not going to be a 46-week series, I promise you that. But, but if you feel moved and called, please use that. And something else I want to just bring to light, there, there is some controversy. When you talk about parables, there's controversy around exactly how many parables there are in the Bible. Um, you know, because Jesus didn't, you know, when Jesus said a parable, it wasn't saying, you know, thus saith the parable. So there's some, some discussion about what truly is a parable and what isn't. So if you see that list, I got it off of a website. I didn't put it on there, but I, uh, I should have, uh, and don't laugh. The, the website, the guy's name is Swamp Meat Dave. He does Bible studies, and I got it off of there, so I don't want you to think that I spent time uh, putting that together. But, but if you look at that list and you say, no, 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 you know, I, I, I read a book, and the book said that there's only 30 parables. You know, honestly, there's really no right answer because we don't know. And so I wanted to give you that list. You know, there may be some things on there that you may say, well, not. Maybe that isn't a parable, but I just wanted to let you know that they, um, they are there for you. But so as we start this series on parables... I'm going to warn you that we're starting at a very unusual place in this. We're actually going to begin looking at Matthew chapter 13, verse 10. Now, why that's unusual is because it's right in the middle of one of the parables that Jesus is speaking on. But in order for us to truly understand what Jesus is telling us in these parables, we have to understand the purpose and the meaning behind the parables. Now, I want to caution you, as we go through the parables over the next couple of weeks, there's, there's one thing I want you to keep in mind. We're going to learn a lot of different things, a lot of specific things about the parables, but as we learn those things, let's not lose focus on the main point of the parable. You see, as we go next week, we're going to be talking about the parable of the soils. We're going to talk about four soils and four seeds. It's not so much about the seed, like what kind of seed was it? It's about the main point. So as we go through the parables, keep your eyes and mind focused on the main point of the parable. And you're going to see that with each parable, there is definitely a main point and a main theme. Now I want to explain to you why we're going to begin in verse 10. Matthew 13, verses 1 through 9, Jesus is talking about the parable of the sower. And really that's about the parable of the four soils and the four seeds. Now I'm not going to talk about that this week because exactly we're going to talk about that next week as, as one of the parables. It's one of the parables that is found in all three of the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But he starts here with the very, very, or he ends this parable with a very interesting statement. So if you have your Bibles open, I want you to jump up to verse 9 for a second. And Jesus says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Now that's kind of unusual, if you think about it, that Jesus would start talking about something, start teaching on something, and then almost at the end of that message, he says, he who has ears, let him hear. You know, if you think about the, you know, the town criers, they would always say, hear ye, hear ye. They would make an announcement saying, listen, because something very important is about ready to be spoken. But here Jesus says, almost after the fact, you know, if you have ears, listen to what I've already told you. And by that time, it's probably kind of too late, like, oh, shoot, wait a minute, what was that? And that's one of the first things, beginning in verse 10, that the, the disciples question. In verse 10, we say, And the disciples came and said to him, Why do you speak to them in parables? He answered and said to them, Because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But to them it has not been given. For whoever has to him more will be given, and he will have abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Therefore, speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. And in them the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says, Hearing you will hear and shall not understand, and seeing you will see and not perceive. For the hearts of this people have grown dull. Their ears are hard of hearing, and their eyes have been closed. Lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn, so that I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. 
For surely I say to you that many prophets and righteous men desired to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. Well, Lord, we just thank you for this message, Heavenly Father. And Lord, I pray that your word would touch even each and every one of our hearts, Lord. Lord, let this message be real. Let this message be personable. Let this message be meaningful. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. So if you remember our, our, our series on the, the apostles, the disciples, not necessarily all, always the most intelligent guys, and sometimes they ask some pretty interesting, funny questions, but, but beginning in verse 10 here, they ask a really interesting question to Jesus. You see, they, they hear Jesus speak in verses 1 through 9, and they're very intrigued by what he's saying. Not the message, but how he's saying it. And he says there, they say there in verse 10, why do you speak to them in parables? Now, it's interesting, number one, that the parables, as we see in the New Testament, is the most common way that Jesus teaches throughout the Bible. And what's interesting is they aren't saying, you know, why did you talk about seeds and soil? But they're saying, why did you talk to them in parables? So they knew that this was a parable. They knew that there was something different about it. Now, for those of you that don't know what a parable is, a parable is almost like an illustration or a story that uses real life things to make something meaningful. So in this parable in verses 1 through 9, he's talking about seeds and soil as a way to appeal to the people. Now, some people may question, why didn't Jesus just tell us what he knew? Well, there's a really good reason. And there's a really good reason why Jesus would use parables. Now, have you ever had that conversation with someone where you start talking about a subject and you know pretty early on that you're in way over your head? And they just start talking more and more and more about it. And your eyes just kind of get glossed over like, oh my gosh, I have no idea what you're talking about. I think I shared with you, like last year I was talking with someone. He found out I was a pastor and so he starts talking about the Bible. And I've never been so scared in my life. Because the only reason why I knew that we were still talking about the Bible is because every once in a while he'd throw in the word God. But I was just holding on for dear life and praying that this conversation would end soon because I, I, I didn't know what he was talking about. But so if Jesus, if you think about it, I said Jesus is the most intelligent, smartest man that's ever walked the face of this earth. If Jesus really talked to us the way that he was capable of talking to us, there would have been nobody that would have understood his message. So he had us say it in a way that we could understand and would be meaningful. You remember, we didn't have recordings back then. We didn't have laptops that we could write these messages on. So everything would be conveyed from generation to generation by story. All these parables that we read about were written years after Jesus spoke. But he had to do it in a way that would make sense to us. You see, we might not know the parable of the, uh, the good sower, sower, the four sowers. We might not know exactly where it is in the Bible, but, but I'm sure if I asked you, if I quizzed you about some of the parables, you would know the meaning and the purpose behind it. So Jesus was very intentional on why he did this. But I also think it's very funny that the apostles, excuse me, the disciples at that point, asked him, why do you teach that way? And just as only Jesus could do, he chooses not to answer the question that they asked him, because in reality, that was the most important part of it. He answers the question that he feels is most important to them. So they ask why, and Jesus answers with a who. And that's what we see in verse 11. He says, he answered and said to them, because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. Now, real quick, we read in, in the New Testament mysteries, and we're like, ooh, it sounds really neat. You know, it's magical. Well, really, the only thing mysteries means, it's written 27 times in the New Testament. Mysteries are the plan of redemption of salvation through Jesus Christ, which was not known until Jesus showed up. You see, we couldn't talk about how the Savior would come back and he would take us to heaven and, and all those things because they didn't know Jesus. And so this great mystery really wasn't a mystery at all. It was something that was revealed the moment that Jesus walked on the face of the earth. But up until that point, it really was kind of a mysterious thing. And, and what we're going to find out is those people that did not accept Jesus into their heart, it really was a mystery to them. They couldn't understand it. So when you read the word mysteries in the New Testament, that's what it's talking about. It's talking about how Jesus walked this earth for our salvation, and one day, thank you, Jesus, we get to live with him in heaven. So they ask why, and being Jesus, Jesus decides to answer who. 
Now, I'm sure in your own life, there have been times where you have asked Jesus and prayed to God about a very specific question and you were looking for a very specific answer. And I don't know about you, but during those times, sometimes I wouldn't get the answer I was looking or hoping for. But it's a reminder to us that Jesus will always give us the answer we need, not the answer we want. Now, the apostles, excuse me, I keep calling the, the disciples at this point. The disciples thought they needed to know why, but he knew that they needed to know who. So he begins and tells them that it's the who that's not important here, not why I talk to them in parables. And he says, there are certain people that are going to know what I talked about, and there are certain people that are going to listen to what I say and not have a clue. But he says, here's the difference between the two of them. And we have to go to 1 John 2, verse 27. He says, but the anointing which you have received from him abides in you, and you do not need that anyone teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things, and is true, and is not a lie. And just as it has taught you, you will abide in it. Now that's kind of a mouthful, it might be confusing, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use a parable. I'm not going to use a parable. I'm, I'm going to tell you what that means. And I'm going to tell you what that means because of how it acted out in my life. Many years ago, we were sitting in a, in a Bible study on a Wednesday night. And um, I knew God had called me into ministry at that point. I was pretty sure he had made a mistake, so I was just waiting for him to correct himself. <laughs> but, but I'm sitting with all these guys. That are, th this room is just filled with people that are truly just Bible scholars. And, you know, they're like, well, you know, it says in Romans 11, 8, da, da, da. And it's, well, but in Proverbs 25, 3, da, da, da. You know, and on a good day, I'm just happy if I know the books of the New Testament or Old Testament. And so I'm sitting there truly, and I mean this, I'm sitting there talking to myself. And I'm asking God, God, how can I be a pastor when I know nothing compared to these people? And I wasn't angry. I was, it was just a serious question because I thought there, there's no way that I could ever minister to anybody because everybody knows more than me. And so as the Bible study went on, and it was a great Bible study, at the end of the Bible study, um, we began to pray for somebody. And, and I became filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, I won't go into a lot of detail about that, but, but for about 45 minutes, um, I did a little salsa dance that was quite interesting. I mean, I, I shook. I mean, I shook um, violently. Uh, to the point where, you know, I had, you know, my money clip was in my pocket. My money clip somehow came flying out of my pocket and ended up on the floor. And as I was doing it, I knew that that was kind of weird. And I tried to stop myself, but I couldn't. And looking back on that, I believe that that was God's answer to my question of how can I do this for you? And the reason why I bring that out is because that's exactly what 1 John is telling us right here. Jesus, God told me, don't you worry about what you know and don't know. I will give you what you know in order to teach. I will anoint you with what you need to know. And because he did that, I'm able to sit up here and teach you today. But that's what Jesus is talking about in this parable. You must be anointed. You must be filled with the Holy Spirit in, under, in order to understand what I'm telling them. Because there were actually very few people in this crowd that day that was going to understand what he was saying. And I saw that happen in my own life the moment that I gave my life to Jesus Christ. You see, for many years, I read the Bible religiously. And I mean that kind of as a pun. Because to me, reading the Bible was a religion, it was not a relationship. But I would read the Bible religiously every day. I would go to church every Sunday. I wouldn't, I wouldn't remember a, a, a word from the sermon. I wouldn't remember a single word or understand it in the Bible. I would pray to God every night, but not really talk to him. As I said, my idea of praying at that point was how fast could I say the Lord's Prayer? And I'd cut out so much of it, I think I had it down to like 10 seconds I could say the whole thing. But the moment that I gave my life to Jesus Christ, the moment that I got serious about it and said, God, I need you, I want you, please help me, is the moment that this book became real for me. And I remember praying, I was on my knees, I remember praying and I opened up the Bible and I started reading. And for the first time in my life, it made sense. And it almost was like a true mystery to me, like I can't believe I didn't know this before. 
And for months, and Janine can confirm it, she would come home and I'd have the Bible in my hand and I'd say, did you know it said this? Scriptures and books that I had read multiple times did not understand anything. But all of a sudden, I had been filled and anointed and I understood what the book was saying. And the more I read it, the more I wanted to read it because it was truly like a great mystery. And I couldn't wait to get to the end of it to understand what it was saying. But what Jesus is telling the, apostles, the disciples here and what he's telling us today is that in order for us to truly understand the meaning of the parables, in order for us to truly understand the meaning of the Bible, we have to first submit our lives to him. And if we don't do that, then it truly is going to be a great mystery to us and we're not going to understand what he's talking about. You see, because Jesus taught in parables, and he did it in such a way so that everybody got something out of it. You know, for the believers, for those the, the, the disciples, the anointed ones, they understood the spiritual meaning behind the parable. So as we're going to read and learn next week, when he talked about the soils and the seed, they didn't get it as soil and seed. They understood the spiritual meaning and purpose behind it. But see, Jesus taught in such a way so that those people that didn't understand, couldn't understand, still walked away with something. So maybe there were farmers in that crowd that heard an interesting story and discussion about our agriculture. But everybody walked away with something that they thought about. The believers he fed, fed spiritual food to. The non-believers, the unbelievers, he, he fed food for thought to. That way, everybody walked away with something. But he says here in verse 12, he says, For whoever has, him more will be given, and he will have abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Therefore I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. And in them the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says, Hearing you will hear, and shall not understand. And seeing you will see and not perceive. For the hearts of this people have grown dull. Their eyes are hard of hearing and their eyes are closed. Lest they should, should see with their eyes and hear with their ears. Lest they should understand with their hearts in turn. So that I should heal them. Now it's interesting. Jesus lays out here right now. We have the haves and the have nots if you will. The haves are the, the disciples. The people that have Jesus. That understand what he's talking about. But then he talks about in this passage. The have-nots. And it's interesting, he calls them, if you look at the other two uh, books where this passage is written, we, you know, in one it's talked about the have-nots, one it's talked about them, one it's talked about the outsiders. So it's the people that are not in relationship with Jesus Christ. And he's making a point to very much say they are not here, they are outside of it. But he says there's a reason why these people are the way they are. Because if we truly want to have a relationship with Jesus Christ, if we truly want to understand his word that is available to us. But so many of us choose not to do that. And so he begins to talk about why it is that they would be like that. He says there's a reason why they don't understand. They aren't ready to understand because they're not ready to be in relationship with me. They're not ready to give up what they have. They're not ready to act on what they have. You see, in all three uh, versions of the story, they quote different passages of Isaiah 6, 9 that says, And he said, Go and tell this people, keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and return and be healed. God tells Isaiah in this passage and he tells us they don't understand, they don't see, they don't listen because their hearts have become dull. Now I can tell you from my own personal relationship God will never force us to be in relationship with Him. God will never force us to understand Him. But if we continue to deny Him, if we continue to walk away from Him, what He's telling us is there a point, there will be a point where He will no longer permit us to understand Him. See, in this parable, He says, their eyes don't see, their ears don't hear, their mind doesn't understand. 
and they won't. And it's a good reminder to us that our actions, our thoughts, our words will always have a consequence. Now, it doesn't mean that, that gee, you know, I've, I've blown it. That I, I'll never have a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's not the truth. Because then we forget all about repentance. But what Jesus is saying is if your hearts continue to stay dull, if your hearts continue to be hardened, there is no opportunity for you to have a relationship with me. And if we choose to have a hardened slash dull heart, then we are losing the opportunity that we should have to have that relationship with Jesus Christ. Paul tells us what are the consequences of a hardened heart. And Jason, the guys, if you want to come on up here. He tells us in Ephesians 4.17, he says, this I say, therefore, in testifying the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness in their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness, to work all in cleanliness with greediness. You see, when our hearts are hardened, when our hearts are dull, there really is no desire or interest on our part to be different than that. But Paul says there, there are a few things that happen to us once we have that hard mind. He says, number one, we have futility of mind. We think our own way, and unfortunately that own way usually means that we're thinking away from God. And because we have a hardened heart, we don't know God the way that we should know Him. We walk around aimless. We walk around with intellectual pride. We walk around trying to rationalize and make excuses for everything. A long time ago, I was praying for somebody. Something that had been going on in their lives. And, and we prayed very specifically, as we should, for something to happen. Thank you, Jesus, did. The only problem? That person after we prayed, after we saw, after I saw that prayer answered, I'm like, thank you, Jesus, for that. The person made a comment to me. What a coincidence that that happened. You see, when we have a hard heart, we can't see or understand how God will work in our lives. Now, these people with hardened hearts, these people with the heart, don't get me wrong, they're very busy. It's not like they sit in their room all day on a sofa watching TV. They're very busy. They have a lot of action, but they make no progress. They really, truly have no purpose. But then Paul says, not only do they not have futility in mind, but they're blind. They don't see what is before them. They don't see God in their life. They don't see how he can work. It doesn't mean that they're literally blind. But it means they're blind to God. It means they're blind to His Word, to His truth, to His purposes, to His promises. And unfortunately, what Jesus is telling us here is that there is no way that they will ever see. Paul tells us, say, you know what blinds us? What blinds us is the gods of this earth. All those other things that we seem to put in place in more priority than Jesus in our lives. The more we put those things in our life, the less that we get to see of God in Jesus. You see, before I accepted Jesus into my life, I was very busy. Probably too busy. But I was busy with the wrong things. I know a lot. You ask me questions about work, about the world, man, I can answer any question. You ask me a question about the Bible, I had no idea. See, I, I couldn't see the Word of God because I wasn't ready to see the Word of God. I couldn't understand the Word of God because I didn't have time for it. But Paul also says if we have this dull hard heart, we live a life away from God. And if we choose to live a life away from God, then the Bible tells us that we will actually be rejected by God. Remember Matthew 7, 23 last week, he said, I don't know you. If we choose to have a hard and dull heart, then we have to be prepared and ready for the time when He will come to us and say, I don't know you. Now, I told you last week, one of the, the, the most interesting 
components of being a pastor is what James tells us, tells us in chapter 3 where he says, I'm going to hold you to a different standard than everybody else. And that's why I take what I do very, very seriously. This isn't a job for me. This is a life. This is a commitment to my God that I'm going to serve him with the flock that he gives me. Now I know when I stand before my God, I will be very comfortable and confident that I did everything that I was called to do, everything I was supposed to do, to feed you his word. But it doesn't mean that you will listen to it. You see, if I feed you, but you choose not to listen, God's not going to hold me accountable when I show up. But he will hold you accountable when you show up. So he says, if we have a heart and heart, we will live a life away from God. Until one day he will say, I don't even know who you are. But then Paul also says is that we will live a life that shames. I don't know if you've noticed recently, but, but we live in a society now that, that is no longer shameless pretty much about anything. Things that we used to consider a sin, things that we used to consider embarrassing or shameful five, ten years ago, are no longer considered the same. In fact, we no longer uh, convict people for sin, but we condone it. You know, sin is no longer anybody's fault. It's somebody else's fault. And you know, I'm so sorry you had to go through that. But no, 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 you, you did nothing wrong. In Hollywood, somebody sins and they end up on the cover of people. I often wonder if people sometimes purposely don't do that as a way to jumpstart their career again. They end up on the talk show circuit. They end up writing a book. I heard a pastor speak once and he said, the greatest problem with society today is that we are no longer embarrassed about anything. And unfortunately, even in the church, we see that happening. So many of us have been conditioned, have been programmed by a society that is becoming more and more godless. I promise this will be the last week I talk about him because he lost yesterday. You know, nobody really criticizes Tim Tebow because he's not a great quarterback spend too much time criticizing because he's a Christian. How hard was that? I mean, I love the guy. I, I, you know, I, I pray for him daily, but I mean, if you're going to criticize him, criticize him because he's not a good quarterback yet. Don't criticize him because he's a Christian. Don't criticize him because he thanks Jesus for what he does. Don't criticize him because he prays for people. Don't criticize him because, you know, I read an article this week. And they were talking about his private life. And there's like, there's nothing there. Like, there's, there's no women. There's no nightclubs. There's no drug addictions. He says, I live a pretty basic life. I hang out with family and friends. That's it. I mean, the press is dying. They got nothing on this guy, except he tebos. And honestly, if you want to criticize me for something, if you want to say I'm a bad person, I hope and pray it's for that. But those that don't hear God's word are those that have become dull and hardened. Those are the people that Jesus truly is reaching out to in these parables. And Jesus ends it with this. He says in verse 16, But blessed are your eyes for they see, and your ears for they hear. For surely I say to you that many prophets and righteous men desire to see what you see and did not see, and to hear what you hear and did not hear. A lot of people wanted to. They just couldn't because they didn't know Jesus. And they didn't understand Jesus. You know, for four decades, and I have to tell you how embarrassing that is to have to admit. For four decades, I sat in church every week. For four decades, I read my Bible. For four decades, I prayed every night. And it meant nothing to me. Unfortunately, 
what I've now come to realize is that it really meant nothing to God anymore. I remember sitting in, in, in church sometimes and I, and I would just literally beg and pray and plead with God. I'd say, God, why can't you change me? God, why can't I be like the other people in this church that seem to have it all together? God, why do I have to be like this? And really what I was saying to God was, God, fix me. I just don't want to change anything. God, I want to read the Bible, but I'm not done sinning. God, I I really do want to talk to you, but... But my priority is elsewhere. God, I really would love to go into a church and really understand a message and really apply it to my life, but I got too much other bad stuff. So God, can you can you fit yourself into my life right now? Can you make me change even though I don't want to? Can you do it in such a way so that I don't even have to change God? See, every time I said that prayer, I I, I promise you, God would just shake his head. He said, you don't get it. You you, You speak one thing, but your actions are saying another thing. And I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful that finally, God took me to my breaking point. See, I did live in a society where all my other gods had blinded me. All my other gods had made me deaf, had made me dumb. And it took God to take all that away from me. So that I could get to a point. So that I could finally beg and plead with him and mean it. So that I could finally understand that the only thing that was going to make my life better, the only thing that was going to make my life full of purpose was Him and only Him. See, I learned the hard way that that God's message, God's word, (coughs) God's offer to have a relationship with me was nothing, was useless until I was ready to listen to it. And I can tell you from that moment on, there has never been a day, there's never been a moment where I haven't known God's truth and God's word, where I haven't known that I now have a purpose and a plan. Amen.